from the Catholic underground. All righty, today on the show, wearable tech for spring, pay TV on the decline, Kickstarter for Catholics, liturgy, and heresy. It's time for our picks of the week as well. Catholic Underground starts now. It is time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 260. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on with us. It's good to be back. Joining us this week, I've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. He's also, uh, well, he's right there in video if you're watching us. Hey, Father. Hey, world. How you doing? Also, Kathleen Lee, teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge, and she is our semi-pro faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, everyone. Jeff Blackwell is our technical director. He's also commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. He Some joins weeks. us. That's right. This week, <laughs> <Sometimes>. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Good to be here, Father. All righty. And Mary Kate Taylor is our disembodied video director for the live stream. Hey, Mary Kate. Hey there. And uh, yes, that's right. You heard her voice for the first time. So now I can be a disembodied voice you, as you, well. That's right. You can be a disembodied <laughs> voice. That's right. Well, we, we've been uh, away for a little while. Um, Various uh, things and vacations and priestly ministries and um, Father Ryan, we had a, a wonderful um, mission and retreat uh, at your parish a couple of weeks ago. It really was great. We got to uh, to have Father John Zulsdorf of Catholicon fame uh, in, and he did the the uh, talks for a couple of mission nights in Lent, and also celebrated a solemn high mass, which was really a beautiful thing. First one we've had in fifty years in the parish, wow. and the people have been talking. Oh, that's good. That's what you want people to do. You want you want the buzz, right? Well, it's Natchitoches, so people are going to talk. But yeah, we want the buzz. We like <laughs> that's the right. buzz. Especially good buzz. That's right. Now, you can yeah, visit Father right. Z's blog at fatherz.org. I like the fact that it rhymes. Well, it's spring, and for most of us, that means it's almost swimsuit weather. Right? Right, Kathleen? It is. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm excited. Yeah, but for geeks, that means <laughs> that it's time to test out our new wearable computing devices. You see... Ah. Some be- geeks don't, we don't go where the flaming uh, uh, orb is. Yeah. We stay inside in the, where the blinds are. Yes, Air conditioning. I, may- yeah. Maybe I should join that club because uh, I have fallen victim to that flaming orb one too mm. many times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it can be a real you-know-what, <laughs> that flaming orb. So, uh, tech blogger Peter McDermott says that means he's going to strap on his Google Glass headset and he's going to wander the streets. Uh, now... I don't know. About <laughs> after a year with Google Glass, uh, he's starting to think that the head-mounted computing doesn't really hold a candle to a, a really good digital watch. And and Father, this is something that that I think is becoming the new kind of contention mode with geeks is the wearable glass-like camera interface thing that connects to your eyeball versus uh, a digital watch that that has a really neat, maybe curved display. Yeah, I think to some degree, um, if you remember back when Windows 95 first showed up. And we all do. Um, w- what we saw basically was active desktop broken. <laughs> yeah. That was the basics. That was the screensaver for everybody because Windows 95 was built with the idea that everybody was going to be connected to the Internet all the time. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was you'd have all this cool stuff and you'd have access to all this information. Well, Google Glass is predicated on the same thing that you're always connected and you always want to know what's going on. So if I walk down the street and I see an old building, I want to know the history of the building. I want to know the phone number of the building. And it turns out that most people just don't care um, about as many things as that. But a good watch uh, is a good thing because what, what we do agree upon is we don't want to have to pull our phone out of our pockets every time we get a text message or a push notification yeah. or we've got to turn left on on you know Hubert Street or whatever. We... We'd like to be able to not keep our phones in our hands all the time. But, you know, we, we're starting to see, well, is Google Glass really the right choice for most people? And I think the answer to that is end up being no. Yeah. And so there is a new device from Motorola called the Moto 360. And why shouldn't they be the first in this scene? Because they brought us the razor that we've talked about to great acclaim. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course, you, you know, Father, there are a couple of smart watches on the market. There's the Pebble and mm-hmm. Samsung has tried. And a lot of people have tried to do something with a watch that will tell you, you know, Bob is calling or your mother texted you. Um, but what makes the Moto 360 interesting are a couple of things. One, it's perfectly round. 
Two, it's designed to be beautiful. Three, it's designed to have a really long battery life. Four, it's designed to be touchscreen. So it runs its own nice. Android instead of just, um, just running a handful of very, very custom designed apps. And five, it uses the new Bluetooth 4.0 standard, the very, very low power standard. And so realistically, those are the things that kill Google Glass. The mm -hmm. battery life on Google Glass is low. Uh, you know, it's it's somewhat stupid looking. Um, you know, and and generally speaking, it's just it's not for everybody. And it's very very expensive. So, Moto 360 will not be out until June. But we we are starting to see that this might be the first of many products in this space that yeah. that might you know cut split the difference between Google Glass and having to constantly keep my phone in my hand. Now I have a, a Pebble. Uh, I was one of the early adopters of the Pebble, and I'm not wearing it right now, as you can see, uh, because the thing that I like about it is, yeah, it tells me when there's a text message. It tells me when um, some basic things are happening on my iPhone, but um, but it's it's a monochrome OLED, and it's not a touchscreen, and so the interface is really cumbersome, and so I just find myself, you know, if I want to know the time, I look down at the Pebble. Um, but uh, but I, I tend to pull my phone out of my pocket, and so the I like the idea of something that um, that is color, that is uh, snazzy, that's socially acceptable, and also is a touchscreen. It's amazing now that we have iOS devices, and almost all smartphones are touchscreens. That's an interface that I want in a device. You know. Yeah, there's. I mean, I just switched from my old boring non-touchscreen Kindle to the Kindle Paperwhite. And I'm shocked at how much I enjoy and how much I, I was kind of frustrated by the lack yeah. of touchscreen. And I think you, Father, and I were talking that we were, each of us did this. We were reading a paper book, you know, a book printed on actual dead trees. Yeah. And both of us uh, at, at different times actually looked at a word and we didn't know what the word was and actually touched the word. <laughs> you know, it's as if vaguely totally guilty. That, you know, everything <laughs> was touchscreen now. So why wouldn't a definition pop up, mm. you know, from my paper book? <laughs> yeah. It's sad, really. That's <laughs> we're being uh, debriefed <laughs> with with uh, with these technical things. So the big question is if if you have a, a head mounted heads up display or a watch, Kathleen, which would you pick? I would probably pick the watch because I think that you know we're talking about it being socially acceptable. Um, I've seen people walk around with the Google Glass, and it's like. Can I, do you think it's socially acceptable for me to say what people are called now that have Google Glass? Can I say this on radio and television? They're called glass holes. <laughs> really? It's true, yeah, though. That's what they're called. I can see that. You know, you yeah. have something Is that's... Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think so. But like, a watch. Yeah. You know, it's it's not something that, you know, you, you don't normally walk around with your watch in your face, you know, so you're... So, it's not a tendency to do that. Right, you know? yeah. It's not something you're constantly yeah. plugged into. But, I mean, I've seen people walk around with their Google Glass, and it's like, oh, wait, hold on. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you doing? It Is could even be more socially acceptable than even pulling your phone out. I think too, so. Because you can look down at your watch, you know. And that's, I've tried, you know, with with being a teacher, every new um, gadget that comes out, I'm always skeptical and always like, if we get one more. But this is, I think, I think, I haven't found much wrong with it yet. This idea. Um, the only thing that I, you know, looking at the images is it's a, it's a, and this is not to be like, it's not to be sexist or anything, but it's a man's watch. So if you're looking for a style as a woman, it's you not could really bedazzle yours. Oh, you don't could tempt just, me. That's right. <laughs> How about you, Mary Kate? Would you go for the watch or the Google Glass? Well, I liked what you said about, um, you know, that it, it's a little bit more convenient to look at a watch than at your phone because you know how we're constantly plugged into our phones. Yeah, and so. You know, with a watch, it's just more kind of practical and functional. So I like that aspect of it. Uh -huh. And Jeff, uh, Jeff, you you use your phone quite a bit. Yeah, and I, I do like the aspect of the watch. In fact, I um, I found a couple of articles on it. One of the things that um, that uh, they brought up was uh, about about the uh, the Moto 360 is the ability um, to to recharge it. It doesn't have a charging port on it, but uh, I, I guess they do that through osmosis or uh, induction. <laughs> so yeah. some way or other. But I, I like to watch better. And and uh, Father Ryan, you were absolutely right. I think a year ago you said Google Glass is 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 not going to last very long. He and called it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What can I say? Yeah. I. Uh, <laughs> you're talking about how you charge the, uh, the the watch. I have I have my little um, uh, Fitbit One, and it's got these little bitty two little itty bitty nodes on the bottom. I don't know if you can see it. Oh yeah, I see and those. and it just kind of sits on top of its charger. Yeah, 
and uh, you don't actually have to dock it too too much or something like that but uh but yeah that, i think that that's kind of the wave of the future mm-hmm. and now i don't know if you've seen that uh scientists <laughs> scientists and science places are developing electromagnetic fields so that all yep. you have to do is be in in the range of this electromagnetic field mm-hmm. and you can charge a device or even you know power whatever it is you need to power um, but, and, and Motorola is actually talking about using wireless inductive charging, yeah. charging, and they've been they 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 claim to have kind of a proprietary new thing. So what's likely to be the case is there will be a little flat pad that'll sit next to your bed, you and just you just set it, the watch yeah. on it. Um, and as long as you're within you know two or three inches of the pad, the the watch will charge by wireless induction. Well, you know, I, I, right now I have uh, I, I think it's made by Braun. Um, it's a, a toothbrush, but. It doesn't actually make physical contact, uh, metal to metal, to charge. It sits on this little plastic stand, and 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 it recharges that way, um, and lasts a couple of weeks too. So, um, it it's scientifically being done. And your teeth are clean. Hey, that's true. That's right. Most of the time, of a brush. That's right. That's right. We'll fix it in post. Yeah, so uh, moving from uh, wearable tech to the content desk. Uh, first mm-hmm. of all, you're listening to the Catholic Underground. We're online at catholicunderground.tv. Je suis Father Chris Decker, also Father Ryan Humphreys joins us, Jeff Blackwell, Kathleen Lee, and the disembodied voice of Mary-Kate Taylor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our Picks of the Week, of course, will be up uh, in a little bit. So pay TV subscriptions actually, if you can imagine, are declining this quarter. Now, this is another thing uh, from the Father Ryan is really a, a tech profit uh, desk too. Um, but it seems that, that folks are, are really catching on to the media that's being um, that's being created by all of the other publishing houses that that are opening up, and and this is actually a really big deal because we see now uh, that that uh, that things are not as they once were. Where if you have a television and you have a cable coming into your house, you must pay one of the big uh, the big cable companies, right, Father? Right, and this is this is something that I've been harping on for a while, and I know a lot of our listeners have have commented and go, "Who cares?" Um, but but you're right. Now that Amazon is making original content, Netflix is making original content, and Hulu is starting to make original content, um, th- we're starting to be in a position where people can reasonably disconnect and stop paying for cable. And this quarter, actually, the the uh, cable market lost 250,000 subscribers. And you can say, well, okay, well, Father Ryan, why is that a big deal? There are 300 million Americans. But... Let me just paint a picture for you. This is a complete shift in the business model and the market for video entertainment. That matters for this reason. That business model and that market have been unchanged since 1940. Wow. It's the only model we know. It's the only model we've ever had. You, you, um, you know, somebody wants to make a show. They want to sell advertising for it. And so what happens is think the Big Bang Theory on CBS. CBS calls up Chuck Lorre and says, make us a show. And Chuck Lorre goes, okay. I'll make you a show, but it's going to be expensive to produce. The actors are part of a union, and they get paid literally hundreds of thousands of dollars per episode. For the next season coming up, Sheldon and all the main uh, main five characters are going to be getting almost a half million per episode. Wow. <laughs> Everybody piece, who wait, works piece? on the show yeah. is part of some union, so they get paid. And so think about this. The cost per episode is many millions of dollars. They're going to produce 22 episodes per season. So let's say it costs $60 million for a season of that show. All right. And so CBS has to has to fork over a check for $60 million. And they've got to then find a way to make that money back and, in fact, make more money. And, in fact, Big Bang Theory right now charges $10,000 per second for advertising while wow. the Big Bang Theory is so on the air. So a 15 to 30 second ad, and that is, wow. I think that's yeah. why you've seen a lot more 15 second ads on TV yeah, too. That's yeah. true. It's it's true. And and so but but what ends up happening is if the number of people subscribing goes down to cable TV, then that means those ads become less effective. Right. And they can charge less money for the ads and then CBS has to say, "Well, Chuck Lorre, I appreciate your situation, but I can't afford <laughs> your 60 million dollars per season. I can only afford 40 million per season." And so the long-term effect of this is that our the quality of those TV shows goes down right. because those houses yeah. can't afford to produce them. And we ought not to say, "Oh, Netflix is making a show." And, and therefore, this is great because those production houses can take a loss yeah. 
That's to right. make to ease into Netflix. Those production houses can go on spec to Amazon and say, we'll make a show we may not make as much money on yeah. because it's an experimental market. But if that if that real money making market goes away, yeah. then the quality of entertainment goes down. And so I'm I'm really wound up about this from a tech and a faith point of view. Because on the tech side of things, it means we we very well may be looking at lower quality entertainment in the future, more reality TV. From the faith point of view, it means that the the death grip that the kind of secular humanist has had on the entertainment industry may be starting to fall away, ah. which could be a good thing. Yeah. And so I'm kind of torn on it, kind of half and half. And we, we, we see that perhaps with, with a little bit more of these uh, independent folks that are coming in that are, ma- that are willing to take a loss on the film because they simply want it to be produced. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you see some of the, I think maybe like the, the Bible series. and things. I don't know if they took a loss. I, I would be willing to bet they didn't. But uh, for a, a network uh, television, I, I should say for a cable network television show, the production value was, was generally very high, mm-hmm. and they just wanted to get it produced. And you could say the same thing of, the, of, of Son of God, this movie. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hearing mixed things about, uh, about the, the production quality and everything, but they're willing to take They just want it up there. They want the content up there. And I wonder, uh, in a sense, as Catholics, if, if that's really not the way that it should be. I often think about our little enterprise, Catholic Underground, that mm. that uh, we've basically been taking a loss, if you will, since we went on the air in yeah. 2006. But but the content that that we offer, we believe, has value and should be somewhere in the market. And so we're willing to to put that there. And, and I wonder if there's not something to that, uh, as you say, Father, because I'm also seeing on enterprises like YouTube or Revision 3, um, where you have folks that that are just kind of uh, you know two brothers that know a little bit about uh, about special effects and cinematography, well they start a YouTube channel and then all of a sudden Revision Three says, hey, we're going to pump some capital into you, keep making what you're making and let us sell ads, and and that uh, is becoming. I mean the, these uh, these guys are, are really making a good go of uh, of special effects from a from a kind of consumer standpoint. Um, and uh, Hack Five is another show that's done that. They started in their in their their apartment, and now they've got a full on studio because uh, somebody got behind them. And I wonder if that's not what is also happening with uh, some of these uh, production houses like Amazon and Netflix. That they're saying, okay, come on in, let's see what you got. Yeah. If you do, let's well, we're going to break the mold of of uh, going and pitching to NBC, and uh, we'll just get behind you if we like what you've got. It's kind of a it's a different view where you go and you shop your idea. They get behind you for a season, yeah. and then we'll go. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah, when I, and I think that's that's a really good thing. The difficulty is Amazon may be able to support two, three, maybe four or five, you know, series yeah. per year, yeah. um, and and Netflix maybe two or three. But it ultimately, you know, the the major cable companies are supporting seventy or eighty. You know, and so yeah. e- either way, th- this does mark a kind of a, a beginning of the end of that old way of thinking about entertainment, which would, which may very well be a good thing. Yeah, and and that's a, I think there's still a place for your major broadcast networks, your NBCs and ABCs and CBS, but they may have to start thinking of themselves more like a movie house, you know, more like a like a Paramount Pictures, which they're all owned. They all own that wing, you know. Mm-hmm. So I I wonder how uh, how that's going to go. Um, if we begin to see uh, network television in a completely different light, you know, um, oddly enough, in in broadcast television, there is one consistent money loser that all broadcast networks still use, and that's that's their news division. Right. News never makes money, hmm. but as a public service to to people uh, to the public <laughs> whom they serve, you see what I did there. Yeah. Uh, they still offer uh, a news uh, a news component. And some of these news gathering uh, uh, folks are, are very good. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, Father Ryan, as you know very well, some of the news gathering can have whatever political slant that it wants. The content doesn't even have to be good. They're just they're providing a public service. And so we get back to the old chestnut of uh, of doing what we ought to do for excellence with a degree of excellence and a content that is that is oriented towards what is right. And again, I, I think the the bottom line here, which Father Ryan touched on. Is um, if it's uh, if it's marketable, if it's got yeah. viewership yeah. Um, or listenership, uh, and it, and it's pulling the ratings, then that's what uh, determines what the uh, ads are going to sell for, 
And uh, I guess it also determines whether or not it's going to be around for a while. But you're right yeah. as far as uh, the news goes. It always costs. It never makes money. That's right. You know what else doesn't make money? Catholic media. We're supported by you. We thank you for your support. All righty. Uh, over to the Enjoy Responsibly desk, which is manned by our own Kathleen Lee. Uh, Catholic Tech Talk says that kids don't know tech, and that is a problem. Yes, the assumption is about tech is that kids magically know it and adults don't. But that's not really logical. Mm, said the so, Vulcan, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's right. But anyway. um, so in reality, tech is made more simple um, so that anyone can understand it. Kids are just more likely to, exper- like to experiment with technology than adults are. Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a real that's the real question. You know, um, is it bad that that kids are, are wanting to get out there? I mean, you've seen it, right, uh, Father Ryan? You've got um, nieces and nephews, Jeff. I'm sure you've got young family members, uh-huh. Kathleen. You certainly do. Uh, where you they they ask they know to ask for the iPhone, <laughs> and they know how to slide to unlock, uh-huh. and they know how to go to the apps that they want. They know how many screens to. It kind of freaks me out, Father. To be honest with you, no, it, it and it's it's a very very real point that Catholic Tech Talk is making that yeah. you know the the tech, the tech is being designed simpler, 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 and um, that means that there's a lower threshold, lower effort to get into it, and that means that all the good things about tech you have more access to, but you also have access to the bad things. And because a lot of people have simply assumed, oh, well, these kids understand this stuff just because even if, even if I don't. And what that means is we've just stopped educating That's right. our kids about what to do. Yeah. You know, and so uh, we'll go ahead. Yeah. And so I was going to say, and so Kathleen, that opens up uh, kind of a Pandora's box. Sure. Well, Catholic Tech Talk points out that um, over half of adolescents and teens have been bullied online. That's crazy what? to think. I, yeah. You know, I, I can't even imagine that but i guess i mean wow. well more than one in three young people have experienced cyber threats Sheesh. Um, and over 25 percent of adolescents and teens have been bullied repeatedly through their cell phones on the internet or or, or on the internet or on the internet yeah, in their, their cell phones yeah oh. their social media and you know i was i was telling father chris earlier i was like you know i i would much rather be bullied old school to my face <laughs> that's like, right Give me your lunch money, yeah. Kathleen. You know, and and, and well, I I grew up kind of on the I was. Uh, you were a geeky kid. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up when, when technology like this was starting to take off, but oh. I, you know, I fortunately, I'm not one of these statistics. I'm not a you know a one in three or half of adolescents. You know, that wasn't me, but um. Mm-hmm. But, but and yeah. I th- I think we ought to we ought to just make a note that. Nowadays, we're so very, very thin skinned. I mean, yeah, bullying that's, that's when true. I was a kid meant somebody repeatedly was harassing me in a way that was really like causing damage to my life. Nowadays, I post a picture on, or a kid posts a picture on Facebook and they go, that's a stupid looking shirt. And we call it cyberbullying and suspend the kid oh, for a week. All right. You that's know, true. so I mean, we, so we have to, we have to a certain sense return sanity and say, how many of these are really vicious and how many of them are just kids being kids and saying, those pants make you look fat. Well, is that cyberbullying or is that just, you know, a kid being a jerk because yeah. he doesn't know any better? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I wonder I wonder what this uh, this whole cyberbullying thing is is doing to our ability to um to communicate. We talk about this all the time. But it, it seems like uh, like there is a component to if if I can be a threat to somebody in a completely virtual way, then I have the ability to become a sociopath at a lot younger age than I would have had to to learn, you know, over over periods of being rejected uh, in person, but you know, with somebody. And so I I wonder if uh, I think back, Father, to um, to the Confessions of Saint Augustine, where he talks about why children have um, have this kind of inclination to just be mean, <laughs> you know. And and he talks about whenever he was young, one of his one of his big kind of come to Jesus moments, if you will, uh, thinking back, was stealing a pear. He and his friends were walking by this pear tree, and he he wasn't hungry. None of his appetites wanted to be fulfilled. The pear was just on a tree, and it was out of reach, and so he stole the pear. 
And he meditated years later on what caused him to do that. And he said, well, I mean, it was just the presence of original sin. It was, is, it was the, the presence of, of concupiscence that caused me to see something I didn't have and want to take it. And what happens whenever, whenever we stop uh, that crucial bit of formation to say, you're going to want the pear on the tree. Mm-hmm. But you yeah. do you do have to fight against that that concupiscence if the pair is not yours, right? Well, and a certain you know, I mean, one of the things I as I'm teaching more in schools nowadays, you see immaturity is marked by the second person, and I mean yeah. that a kid will look and who is immature will say, "You need you this, you that," or they're telling a story and they go, "You think that this, that, and the other," and they they they're projecting what mm-hmm. their emotions are onto everybody else. Yeah. You know, and, and Kathleen, I'm sure knows about this where the kid will, will, you'll say, tell me, tell me about how you felt. And they go, you felt, you feel like you're just worn out and you feel like you're tired and you feel like you feel like you're, yes. and, and it's because, because the kid doesn't have a, a broad sense that their way of seeing the world is not the only way of seeing the world. Yes. I, I'm constantly telling my students, I don't care what everyone else, I'm asking you. Mm-hmm. So I want you to use you, me language. That's right. I feel when because yeah. kumbaya, and they they well, they struggle with that so much mm-hmm. because they but don't want to claim it. It's kind of a, it's just a natural it. narcissism that comes from youth because the only perspective you have is the one in your head. Yeah, mm-hmm. you've not learned to listen to other people, and so as you get older, you know, and you read, you move out of adolescence, you stop using second person language, and you start moving toward this is the way I feel, mm-hmm. and this is the way I think, and that in and of itself. You know, as I think one of the big reasons we think about bullying, but frankly, a little kid doesn't know the difference. A little kid only knows their own environment at home. And if mom and dad let them do anything they want at home, then they have no way of understanding why the teacher won't let them do exactly the same thing at school. True. Very true. So in regards to this, what can we do as as adults? Well, for education, I mean, I, I would argue that because we're talking about what adults need to do for kids, yeah. we need to teach them about technology. I yeah. mean, not just assume that they know because they can set the clock on the VCR, <laughs> but we need to really say, you know, kids, th- th- here, here's how you need to act. You need to do this. You need to do that. Um, you are not allowed to use this certain kinds of social media. You're not allowed to uh, use your phone with Snapchat. You're not allowed to use Instagram unless you turn your phone in at the end of the day and I'm going to look at everything you post in there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think those kinds of things of, of accountability and education are things that parents need to enforce upon their kids and not simply assume. Yeah, because oftentimes I think for a parent, it, it just seems it's too big. It's too big a thing. Well, there's the, the internet is really big. And I have no idea what he or she is doing on a daily basis. Um, so the the notion of saying, well, uh, if you're going to have this device in your hand, you will be answerable and accountable to me. And and I took this class or a father gave this class and I know how to get into, I may not know everything, but I know how to get into your applications. I know what you're using. I'll ask you what you're using. Mm-hmm. And, and there will be some accountability. I just gave a talk a couple of weeks ago to some of the uh, the Catholic educators for the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Hi, guys. Uh, and and it was really enlightening because they, they knew quite a bit. Um, there were some that really didn't know much of what their kids were using. But the other difficulty is that there are no social media rules for a lot of the Catholic schools. And, and so they're like, well, we can't, even, we can't even, as teachers, monitor where they are. So, so we just need to at least know what they're using and yeah. what we're hearing you know, in our classrooms so that we can then begin as, as Catholic educators or as who, who know, even public school educators to educate them on the level of philosophy of communication and morality. Right. You know, I think that's where, where we, we can begin to win the war. Um, and, and Kathleen, that's yeah, I think part we, of what you do every day, yeah, I imagine. I think with education comes the responsibility and, and you know, for kids to, to, for young people to know that they're one person. You know, I, I see too many of my students, um, you know, you hear something about, you know, something that they did online and you think, no, they, they are a great person. Yeah. You know, it's so easy for anybody, especially young people, to be who they want to be online. And sometimes it's not always the best. But especially for adults and just echoing the, the same thing, you know, I am very fortunate in my life to have adults who were adults and yeah. they weren't intimidated by me. You know, even though I may have known more about technology than they did, you know, it was they were very quick to learn because they responsible for me right they cared about you genuinely Mm -hmm. you know and and i have like mad respect for parents who have all their kids passwords and you know and things like that i love that i think that that is 
it's helping them. It's not an invasion of privacy. You know, yeah. your, your, your kid shouldn't have privacy really. I, I mean, it's in some senses, but like in a sense, like they're, what they're using technology wise. No, yeah. you know, it's just dangerous. And so, um, you know, I, I think that adults, we really need to watch out for the kids in our lives, the young people in our lives. Um, and, and help yeah. them to be responsible. And they'll be the adults of tomorrow, as mm-hmm. I said. If we're if we're breeding young sociopaths now, yeah. Yikes. Well, you already see it in some in some adults that I work with. I'm like, who ever taught you to use social media or yeah. anything? On, because you are horrible, like at it. Yeah. So you know you're already seeing that in the adults of today. That's oh, right. sounds like you're bullying over there, hey. Kathleen. Hey. <laughs> Shame hey. on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Taylor in the chat says, "My dad refused to let me make a Facebook account unless he set up the privacy settings and uh-huh. I would be friends with him so he could monitor it." That's why a lot of uh, young people are moving away from Facebook mm-hmm. is because right. it's not so easy to monitor. Right, but right. one of the interesting things, with the exception, with maybe the exception of direct messages, is that uh, Twitter and Instagram are you're, they're public, you know. Uh, yeah. But there there are always ways around it. Oh yes, always, always, always. So, uh, moving from content into the real world, mm-hmm. CatholicStarter.com is Kickstarter for Catholics, and I have been wondering because you know at Kickstarter you can't you can't be a religious organization like the Catholic Underground and um, and and build a, up a, a a Kickstarter for one of your events or projects like Catholicon. Uh, so um, so Michael Garcia sent us an email to let all of you folks know about catholicstarter.com, and the notion is they're trying to connect Catholics for the sharing of time, talent, and treasure to promote the work of Catholic entrepreneurs, artists, and parishes to obtain funds and to bring projects to life in an effort to act as lights of the world in the name of Christ. Jeff, I just read this whole thing mm-hmm. that uh, you were supposed to read. <laughs> oh, no, 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 uh, and, and uh, I'm glad you, you read it, uh, but you, you didn't emote as much as I would. No, be. that's true. That's very true. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, actually, I went to the website, and, and I was like, oh. Uh, Let me see uh, it, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, because uh, I think this is such a great idea. Um, quite often, I, you know, I have extra time, and I'd, I'd, I like to contribute my talent uh, to, um, sure. uh, you know, to, to especially to Catholic. Uh, apostolates um, like ours. Uh, there you go, apostolates. Start to say charities. But, um, well, we are charity. Uh, yes. uh, indeed, but uh, what a great <laughs> idea. And it's uh, uh, the, uh, the time has come uh, for CatholicStarter.com. Now, if you go to the website, there's not really a lot uh, it's there. It's a tease. Kind of like a, a mission Pets. statement. And they got yeah. a clock with a countdown because it uh, launches on April 21st. Uh, but um, you can go ahead and sign up, and which I did, uh, because I kind of want to see what they're going to do with it. Yeah. Now, uh, as long-range plans, we don't know yet, but um, it certainly is a pretty interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, Father, as usual, you, you are our resident curmudgeon. So, yes. uh, so uh, how, how, no. how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Grumpy Cat, is that you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Lay off, I'm starving. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, I'm 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 hopeful. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that the the interface is like Kickstarter. I'm hoping they've got their their stuff together in terms of balancing the the pledging and the money and everything. Uh, so I'm hopeful. Yeah, I am too. I really am. I'm reserving judgment because this is a fairly difficult thing to implement well. Yeah. When you're yeah. talking about handling large amounts of money. Yeah. Um, and when you're talking about doing it in a way that's stable, I mean, Kickstarter has caused, I've had some real problems with Kickstarter because the only way you can fund it is through Amazon. And that's, oh. you know, I mean, I've got some of my Amazon stuff tied up with the the charitable work I've done and with parishes. Yeah. And so it's very difficult for me to, to be involved with a Kickstarter project. And, you know, I'm, 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 it's tough to get this thing working, but I really like the idea that if I have some extra cash, um, I can go somewhere and I can actually invest it in a way that I, where I'll be able to find something. I've never understood why Kickstarter is so viciously anti-religion. Yeah. Um, but this is a fairly logical thing to do. Um, but he's going to need a critical mass of people and he's going to need to be able to really prove that he can handle that money. You know, that's, that's right. a tough thing yeah. to do. Yeah, but I mean, I'm already thinking about some of the projects that I would love to Catholic start. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. um, a, a printing of Joe Catholic. I, I've got one page left. One page, baby. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Great, um, great. But to, to do a printing of it. Um, uh, Catholicon 2015, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, things of that nature could be prime for this. But I'm, I'm just, uh, for you guys, Michael, I'm a little just fearful 
Uh, I just hope you've got all your proverbial ducks in a row because it is a it is a large undertaking. Uh, so know that uh, Michael, from one Catholic new media guy to another, uh, we'll be praying for you and uh, and let us know at the Catholic Underground if there's anything that we can do uh, to to help give you voice because I, I I shudder to do it, but I will. Catholics often CD to C. Catholics often default to cheese, and I just want I want it to be good. I want yeah. it to be good. I want it to be good. Uh, so there we go. You're listening to the Catholic Underground. I'm Father Chris Decker, joined by Father Ryan Humphreys from Historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Uh, he's via Skype. We've also got Kathleen Lee, who sits to my left, which is your right. Uh, Jeff Blackwell in the production room there, and Mary Kate Taylor. Mary Kate, how's it going in the uh, the video production room? Going good. Going great. Yes, indeed. We've got her voice now, and so we move on to our list of the week. Uh, 15 major heresies and those who fought them. <laughs> you knew we had to do this list sooner or later because it's. You it's do that, like uh, your list. <laughs> I do do very much enjoy my list. So, uh, contrary to what uh, to many who think that the talk of heresy is just being pessimistic or closed minded, uh, we Catholics need to know the things that we don't believe. There's a reason at uh, your Sunday Mass that you profess the Cosment- Constantinopolitan Nicene Creed. The Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. I can't remember how it goes. Ding ding. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but but it's an inval- it's a valid and an important way of clarifying. You know, we talk about in a positive sense what we believe in the Nicene Creed, but that didn't get made until 325 years, and there's a lot that happened in those 325 years, and there's a lot that's happened since that 325 years, all the way up even into our present day. Uh, So just like an athlete might ask a coach about the boundaries of a game, ask what's in and what's out, isn't that what you do? I know whenever I played disc golf for the first time in my life uh, Mm -hmm. this past week, I had to say, what are the rules? What's out of bounds? What's what's the fairway? What isn't? Um, we, We inform our faith by asking what's in, and was heresy, you see. We, we clarify uh, fuzzy things. And there are 15 in the list, so we'll put that in their show notes, but we're going to pick out our favorite five. Uh, go to the link to read about them all. The first one, of course, um, one of our favorites that is still en vogue today is Pelagianism. Mm. Pelagianism, that's right. Look that up. Touch that on your Kindle and see what comes up. And, and of course, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, the inimitable, the unrepeatable Saint Augustine uh, was one of the ones who spoke quite a bit about this, um, and this is this is a quote: uh, "There is an opinion that calls for sharp and vehement resistance. I mean, the belief that the power of the human will can, of itself, without the help of God, either achieve perfect righteousness or advance steadily towards it." Um, we can boil this down into the very popular phrase, Father Ryan that God helps those that help themselves. I don't like that phrase. Lies! All <laughs> lies! <laughs> exactly. That's what I've been trying to say for years. Uh, Pelagianism radically corrupted the church's teachings on grace, on sin, and on the notion of, of fallen humanity, of the fall. Um, the, the British monk Pelagius, who of course was named after this thing. Uh, no, no, he named it, actually. Uh, he, he was startled by some of the words of St. Augustine in his confessions, and, uh, and Pelagius taught that the sin of Adam had no bearing on subsequent generations. So essentially, man was inherently good and unaffected by the fall. And what we believe as Catholics is that through the sin of our first parents, through that first sin of turning away from God, that, because they are, are the archetype of humanity, they pass that sin on. Uh, through generations. So each one of us is born with original sin. That's one of the very basic tenets of what we believe as Catholics and certainly as Christians as well. Pelagian, Pelagius didn't believe that. And so essentially, you know, he said, hey, everybody's good. <laughs> this is the other phrase. It's all good. Yeah, you got it's all good. Uh, in fact, you can even get better by just doing stuff that's good. And the whole notion of merit is gone. Um, St. Augustine upheld the truth that God's grace, remember grace is that supernatural stuff that God gives us to sanctify us and make us more like himself. God's grace is entirely necessary for any movement of ours toward God to occur at all, meaning that we can will good in and of ourselves, but we need, we need, we need, we need God's grace to be able to accomplish the good that we may will. Did I get that right, Father? I think I did. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, Kathleen's favorite is next, and this is another heresy that still continues to be with us today. 
Gnosticism. G N O Osticism. Yes, some might say Gnosticism, but it's not. Yes, quote, but it's not. But it's uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Ta-ding. So here is a quote: How can they say that the flesh goes to corruption and has no share in life when it is nourished mm-hmm. by the Lord's body and blood? So Gnosticism was arguably arguably the biggest heresy of the early church. And among its central tenets was that Christ was merely a spiritual being and not a flesh and blood man. And that God the Father was actually a malevolent, try saying that one mm-hmm. six times fast, a malevolent demiurge, which was just like an evil-minded, God-like creator spirit. And that all matter was inherently evil. Bad. So, um, the chief saint who fought Gnosticism was, and dismantled all aspects of it was Saint Irenaeus of Lyons. Mm-hmm. Lyons. Lyon. Lyon. Well, yeah. If you want to be all French, about <laughs> I'll it. be all French about it. Uh, so anyway, he tenaciously held that Christ was God in the flesh. For if Christ was merely a phantasm, mm-hmm. then he did not suffer and die at all. Yeah, this bam! is bam. There it is. It's really interesting in Gnosticism because it rears its ugly head now, especially in uh, in sexual ethics mm-hmm. and in in morality. Basically, it says spirit is good, body is bad, 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 uh, and so do whatever you want with the body and just don't worry about it because it has no bearing. Yeah, and a lot of uh, a lot of modern Baptists who use the phrase "earth suit" in Sunday school will say, "Oh, this body doesn't matter." The body's just an earth suit. It's just a coil that we have, Ooh. and then we die. We we become truly free. That is another expression of this Gnostic belief. It's another another expression of this heresy. <laughs> Yikes! Earth suit. I'm not like earth that. suit. That's what I had. I had a teacher at one of Might my well Catholic call schools me a meat who said bag. that some years I mean, ago. Just, whoa! Yeah. Yep. You know? hmm. That's yeah. here. That's not correct. Thank yeah. you for your time. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff. Well, I like this list. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff's favorite heresy, of course, Arianism. And St. Athanasius. Yeah. Yes. And here's a quote for you. Mm -hmm. And thus taking a body like to ours, because all men were liable to the corruption of death, he surrendered it to death instead of all, and offered it to the Father. Ooh, I like that. That purdy. Yeah. Yeah. He took a body like ours, Mm -hmm. because all men were liable to the corruption of death, and he surrendered it to death instead of all men. And offered it to the Father. And I, I did wow. Know, uh, yeah. Neato gang. Arianism <laughs> is, um, is, is arguably the, uh, the most famous of all Christian heresies. And uh, it struck at the, the very root and core of Christian teaching uh, that Jesus was God himself in the flesh and relegated the person of Jesus Christ to that of a, a mere created thing. And it lives on today in varying forms from well-known sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. But... Um, by emphasizing, excuse me, and stubbornly holding to the truth, I'm sorry, I got this little frog in my throat. That's right. You, um, yep. uh, uh, as, let me start over. By emphasizing and stubbornly holding to the truth of Christ as both God and man, St. Athanasius, along with others such as St. Hilary of Poitiers, mm-hmm. effectively yep. ended the reign of the Arian heresy within the church. Now, what is the The, 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 the Arian date? heresy was a Big, big, big deal okay. because Father well, Ryan, as you know, the in, church was split for many, many hundreds of years between the it, true church of Rome mm-hmm. and the Arian church. It lasted for almost 400 years. Wow. And, and the heresy that we're in right now, the modernist heresy, is probably the only thing that we can compare that to is the Arian heresy. Because for a while, we even had a fully Arian pope. Yeah, uh, a heretic at the at the papacy, and just to prove the the uh, the beauty of that charism, he never taught error, not even once. Right, but he was a full on heretic, you know, and that's mm. it's it's crazy. Yeah. Before we get to modernism, uh, let's talk about the thing that preceded it: uh, Calvinism and uh, and Saint Francis de Sales, who uh, right. who fought against it. Here's the quote: In fact, I ought. Uh, I thought that as you will receive no other law for your belief than that interpretation of Scripture, which seems to you the best, you would hear also the interpretation that I should bring, namely that given by the Apostolic Roman Church, which hitherto you have not had except perverted and quite disfigured and adulterated by the enemy, who well knew that you had seen it in its purity, never would you have abandoned it. 
Uh, the arrows of Calvinism took the entire Council of Trent to articulate, and of course, uh, they remain vibrantly alive today. Um, they all come back to excess trust in the individual person and include a personal interpretation of Scripture, of justification through the personal acceptance of Jesus as Lord, and the exclusion of the church as a necessary part of Christ's saving work. And, um, and, and it also taught, certainly, that because of all this, uh, humanity is completely depraved. And so you, you can't will any good. You can't do any good for yourself. Um, Calvinism also uh, begat uh, the notion of, of uh, predestination, that some are saved and some are damned. And, uh, and really, you, 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 if you're on the damned side, and you may be, who knows, um, then, then just, just give up now. <laughs> mm. You know, really, kind of a, a kind of a mopey way of looking at the world. And then uh, Saint Francis, um, known as the gentleman saint, uh, his untiring love for souls, especially seen in his work uh, "Introduction to the Devout Life," which was his greatest. His knowledge of the faith and history, and his incredible ability to adapt and endure all manner of obstacles and hardship, set him uh, sent him to to make uh, probably one of the greatest doctors who who went forth against the errors of Calvinism and he taught very well that um, that we are inherently good we're created good we may have to suffer with the effects of original sin we may be fallen but we are created good by God and uh, then there's this notion of of, um, of kind of uh, that we are all predestined we are we are chosen by God and intended for heaven that's mm-hmm. where we're predestined yes but we can choose. Uh, not to go in that direction. We can right. choose something other than heaven. Uh, it's when, within our, our free will. I think I got that one right, uh, Father. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty uh, pretty good way of describing it. Yeah. The uh, the last the heresies will do because I want you to have a little time to do those seven stages there at the end. Yeah. Um, is modernism and modernism is a heresy that actually a lot of people would argue does not exist. But Pope Pius X was was extremely clear. Uh, in his, he wrote a number of documents, one called the Syllabus of Errors and then one called Pascendi, which is an epic, epic document on thought. And he basically, modernism, we could talk a lot about it, but it comes down to uh, the culmination of a lot of errors. And it basically is a kind of casual arrogance that simply doesn't believe truth or reason really matters. Yeah, You know, it, it's alive and well inside the church and outside the church when you hear people say things like, well, as long as you're a good person. Um, you know, we should just worry about the poor and not get caught up in all these specific details about who Jesus is or what he taught. Mm-hmm. Well, it does. Jesus wouldn't care uh, if if I did this, that, or the other because I'm a sweet person or I tried hard. You know, that kind of thinking is a really good way to go to hell, um, and mm-hmm. and you know, something we ought to try to avoid. You know, given the given the choice, that's very true. Um, you can read more about modernism in any periodical. Uh, so before we move on to our picks of the week really quick, uh, Pat Archibald has written a pretty excellent description of his understanding of the seven stages of heresy, and we'll run through them really quick. Stage one, immoral practice is clearly condemned and anathematized, which means, uh, you know, pointed out, right? Cut out, right? Um, the eternal salvation of souls is at stake. Some people still do it, but they are understood to be sinners and sometimes socially ostracized. Stage two of heresy is... Immoral practice is still clearly condemned, but nobody really talks about it. More people do it, but it's not considered ideal. Um, Stage three, immoral practice is formally condemned, but such condemnation is rarely taught. Uh, Many more people do it. It's just the way life is sometimes. Are you beginning to kind of see some identification? Stage four, immoral practice is still formally condemned, but most clergy look the other way, and some even encourage it. Most people do it. What's the big deal? Uh, Stage five, immoral practice is still formally condemned, but we must find a way to act pastorally towards all who engage in said practice. The church is seen to be unnecessarily hurting those with its outdated intolerance. To be more pastoral, we encourage more of the immoral practice because our growth has taught us that people's feelings are more important than their souls. Stage six, immoral practice is still immoral, but those charged with the care of souls and safeguarding the truth will say things like, that ship is sailed, or it's not that important, or it's not relevant, or we are not obsessed with such matters, or we need to encounter people where they are, or ultimately the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful, has spoken. Um, Yeah, those who don't do it are considered obsessed, wild-eyed, intolerant freaks who are ultimately harming the church's outreach. And stage seven, Immoral practice is still immoral, and church still formally condemns it, but the ubiquitous immoral practice has spawned worse ones, so we now even have bigger fish to fry. Congratulations, you're in full-blown heresy. Yay! 
movie. I would like to think that we're not there yet. But we are. But I think mm. we are. With so many ways. Things, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Hey, Check- mm-hmm. it, it is what it is. Uh, uh, is isn't that what? It, yeah, it is what it, it is. is. That's yeah, right. It is what it is. Today, yeah, I'm just sorry. keep moving on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and you know, where we are, things are what they are. But the church teaches, Jesus teaches us they don't have to be there. Um, for reference, the woman at the well. Yes. <laughs> in Samaria. He called out what was going on, and he called her higher. He called her out of the situation. And you know what? She responded. So, um Living there. water for everybody. That's right. That's right. That's Living water for everybody <laughs> if they want it. Right. If they you want gotta it. Gotta want it. That's right. Uh, which is another another phrase, right? Okay. So we move from all of that to our CU picks of the week. And uh, for our first pick of the week, let's uh, Kathleen, I'm, you're, I'd like to hear yours. Okay. Well, I- We got to be quick because yes. we're on the clock here. <laughs> yes. I guess uh, my pick this week is a group called Clocks and Clouds. And I heard them- um, Last week in in New Orleans at a uh, at an event, they're really cool. It's it's three made of three people. This musical group and it's a celloist, mm-hmm. a violinist, and a drummer, and that's Ooh. it. And at first, I was like, I don't know about this, but it's this awesome fusion of classical music and like rock. And I was like, I don't know, awesome. They've put pickups in their you know in their cello and their violin. They use loops. They use wow. percussion. I mean, it's like being in a rock show like think about the most epic um movie soundtrack you've ever heard clocks and clouds really and they have a they have a couple of eps which are um really short albums so they're really good to you know they're really not that expensive to download um great group they're they are kind of a faith-based group but not yeah they're they're one of those switch foot kind of yeah they are so cool i mean just so cool to watch that clocks and clouds and she's been on the clock, and she's doing great. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, your pick of the week. This is one of my uh, eldest daughter uh, ta- told me about, and it's pretty neat. It's it's not like... Um, uh, E-cards. Cause or I, yeah, because I know you, you like to do the graphic stuff. But anyway, it's Red Stamp. Two mm-hmm. words, Red Stamp. It's a free app uh, to create all sorts of greeting cards, thank yous, graduation, wedding cards, what have you. Um, and you have to, you know, you have to give them your email address and sign up, but, um, they have hundreds of cards to choose from. And in fact, I, I emailed you one today, Father Chris. And I received it. Oh, well, we'll have to do a little show and tell here. That's right. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a real, real basic program. You don't get to choose your, your style of font and stuff like that, but at least they have some great templates. Uh, they do have extra benefits though. Like, um, let's say if you wanted to have, um, an invitation to a party, you just submit your address. They will do you. You design the, the thing online or on your iPhone or on your laptop. Send it into them. They actually will turn around, print it, put it in envelopes, address it, stamp it, and mail it for you. So wow! Yeah. So uh, check out redstamp.com. I like that, Father Ryan. Your pick. My pick of the week is a simple app for my Android called Automatic Call Recorder. Every time somebody calls me, it immediately and automatically records both sides of the phone call Ooh. and oh. just puts it in the in the memory. And then after I get to 50 calls, it throws away the oldest unless I have told it to save. Wow. I can email the files, download the files, share the files on Dropbox. Um, it is just a good way to kind of cover your rear. If you get a weird call <laughs> right. from somebody, yeah. Um, yeah. you mark it. And if you don't, it just it only remembers the last 50. It doesn't kill too much space on the device. Hmm. And um, hmm. I've, I've had some really beneficial. I've, been, I've had some calls where I said, I'm glad I, I'm glad I recorded that. So it's free, uh, and it's Android only. There's no iPhone version, but it's Android only, and it's called an Automatic Call Recorder, and the link for Google Play is in the show notes. And that's basically any call that Father Ryan and I have ever had. You know, he's recorded, he saved yeah. it, because you never know. You just never know. <laughs> you want to talk about bullying. <laughs> Father Ryan bullies me all the time. <laughs> I love it. And uh, my pick of the week is uh, your local disc golf course. Yeah. As I alluded to uh, this past week, I had the opportunity to go with uh, some of my friends from from Austin, Texas, some great, great Catholic families, uh, Jason and Chris, whom you know. I call you officially friends of the Catholic Underground because they might even be on next month uh, when Father Ryan has a lot of liturgies to see to. Um, so, uh, so I would say your local disc golf course and disc golf, of course, um, it's it's fun. It's easy. You don't have to be terribly athletic to do it, um, which is exactly why I cottoned to it right away. And really, if you're not counting par, 
you can have a lot of fun with it. And yeah. uh, my Fitbit uh, showed me that that I actually got a lot of of ac- exercise exercise while uh, while doing this. Uh, Father Ryan, have you ever played disc golf? I've not. I've played ultimate frisbee, but it seems like it'd be something I'd really enjoy because it's kind of a low stress thing, but yeah. good and yeah. yeah. Maybe you and I can find a disc golf course uh, up up in, in Natchitoches. I doubt there's going to be one up here, but I'll search for disc golf in Louisiana or even as we're talking. Yeah. Talking. Uh, and, <laughs> we're and, 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 and the uh, sporting goods stores, in fact, because my son got into it with a friend of his, and I mean, he was going like every other day. And uh, they have these little uh, affordable discs you can get, yeah. you know, like a, a set of three. So, uh, But let me tell you, apparently it makes a difference what kind of disc you oh, get. Oh, yeah. It does. It's, it's yeah. interesting. It's crazy. How that works. You know there's there's one in Baker, Louisiana? There sure is in North Baton Rouge uh, where where my my roots are. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. exciting? But over in Hol- Highland Park has one, That's too. right. Highland Park has one, too. Uh, so if you're in Baton, Baton Rouge. Rouge yeah. I know a lot of folks uh, that... that, that uh, Davin the disc golf. We also want to, to to take this opportunity, Father Ryan, to talk about uh, where we're headed in October, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we should talk about it. We're going to a pilgrimage uh, to Rome, Assisi, Florence, and Orvieto. We're going to be celebrating Mass at all the major basilicas. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, the Colosseum and doing all the other kinds of things that you want to do. It's October 20th through 29th. It's incredibly inexpensive, $3,750, give or take. Plus uh, lunches and spending money that's crazy cheap. Airfare is already included in that. Um, And it will be a beautiful Catholic pilgrimage. Mass every day. Lots and lots of time for prayer and spirituality as well as time for relaxation and enjoying yourself. Um, You need to sign up here probably very soon by either calling 318-352-3422 or by emailing uh, us here at the Catholic Underground. Lots of lots of, uh, of really good opportunities associated with this. We hope you'll be able to come. Again, that's eight, October 20th through 29th. We're going to be going to Rome with CC Florence and Orvieto. You can call or email us to get more information. That's right. And uh, as always, we thank those of you who support us in any number of ways. Right, Jeff? Yes, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That is correct, and uh, for those of you who've clicked that link, we thank you. Also, uh, for those of you who support us with your prayer and those of you who support us with your financial contributions, we we thank you from the bottom of our collective hearts. Uh, and they all try to beat in unison, uh, even Kathleen, who actually has two hearts. She is a That's time true. lord. We didn't want to tell you, but, well, <sighs> now Secrets the out. Is, yep, it's out Stereo now. hearts, I like that. That's right, stereo oh, hearts. Oh, that would be that, that would be totally our name whenever we got together. <laughs> that would be a cool band right. name. Mary Kate, would you like that? Yeah, I like that. I would like that. <laughs> That's right. For the show notes that accompany this episode in the podcast, you want to find out more about our apostolate, you can do so uh, by going on to catholicundergroundcom That is our website. Uh, Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thanks, Father Ryan. It's been my pleasure. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director of the CU. He's the ruling despot of the Blackwell Communications Group, jeffblackwell.us. And on Twitter, he's at Jeff Blackwellus. Thank you, Jeff. It's good to be here, Father. Kathleen Lee is our faith ninja on Kathleen Y-A-B-R on Twitter. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. That's right. Mental synchronization. Uh, Mary-Kate Taylor is an evangelist, and in her spare time, um, she trains sharks to wear laser beams on their heads. It's Thank going you, well. Kate. It's going great. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. You can join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground. We're faith gone digital. And we will see you next time. Catholic Underground.